<clears throat> yes, please forgive my voice. Um, I'm recovering from laryngitis, so the sound quality of my voice is not going to be awesome, so I may have to take water breaks from time to time. Um, and thank you all for being here. I know it's the last session of the afternoon, and we've all been absorbing a lot, so today I'm going to be talking about... Today I'm going to figure out where my uh, presenter uh, notes went, and then I'm going to be talking about uh, composing a piece of music using gen generative neural networks. So, um, as mentioned, my name is Molly Jones, and I'm a back-end engineer at Spantry, and I'm also a, a musician, composer, improviser on the Chicago improvised music scene primarily. And, and today's presentation is going to be basically a case study of a piece of music I wrote that was for live performers along with two scratch-trained neural networks. And so there's kind of two goals I have in this presentation. And one is just to share how I, as an individual artist, um, working with the technology that I know how to use, uh, made a piece of art with neural networks collaboratively and sort of the challenges I faced along the way. And then the other goal is to make a roadmap of challenges that could be used by any independent artist who wants to incorporate machine learning and deep learning into their work. My eventual goal is to make it easier for artists to find an entry point into using deep learning in their creative process in sort of an, an original and ethical way. And um, there's a lot of public dialogue around uh, proprietary generative AIs, Dolly 2, Mid Journey, also ChatGPT. This week, Google started releasing access to Music LM, which is a text to music model. Um, and um, I think artists need to be part of that conversation and understand how these things work if we want to influence the future directions and um, have a say in the very many creative ways these tools can be used. <clears throat> So, I work at Spantry Technology Group. Uh, I'm a back-end engineer, and uh, yes, the Spantry team is pretty much all here. Um, <laughs> we help our clients build data-intensive solutions, so uh, clients have big data, fast data, or complicated data. That's kind of uh, what we do. And then uh, this year, fall of 2022 through 2023, I'm also a composer in residence at the University of Toronto. And um, I received my MFA, my Master of Fine Arts degree in computer music uh, at the University of California, Irvine back in 2016. And so um, this year I've been working with the University of Toronto's Tapir Lab, which stands for Technology and Performance Integration Research. And this image is of Ayun Huang, who runs that lab. Um, with the goal of making an electroacoustic piece of music for neural networks uh, trained on the sound of live performers alongside those live performers. So it's like the chance for the performers and the neural networks to learn from and respond to each other. A uh, quick thank you to Tapir Lab and also the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada for supporting this work. So just to kind of give you an idea where I'm coming from as a creative person, I'm going to play you just a couple snippets of pieces that I've made in the past. Um, as I mentioned, I'm really active in Chicago's improvised music scene, and I play saxophones. Uh, so here's, an here's like a quick excerpt uh, from an improvisation I did with a percussionist, Tsuya Nakatani. <laughs> Just to give you an idea of the kind of sound worlds I'm in, I definitely work in sort of experimental spaces. And then this is just for funsies. This is a piece I made for Northwestern's New Music Conference a couple years ago. It's called Shannon's Entropy. For those of you uh, with any kind of like interest in information in Claude Shannon, it's dedicated to Claude Shannon. And it's a, a little video collage piece that is made, the, the sounds are entirely uh, beats made from samples of analog computing equipment. So an abacus, a slide rule, a typewriter, and a pencil on paper. So I'll just play a little bit of that for you too. So that just kind of gives you a couple examples of pieces that I've made in the past. Um, and get back to my slides. So that'll bring me up to kind of this piece, which is a new area in my creative practice. Um, which is this piece, Approximations, which I'm going to be focusing on for the rest of the talk. So what you're going to see here is the technical side of creating a proof-of-concept composition, which is what I consider this piece to be. 
You're going to see an individual artist training a neural network from scratch, and you're going to see the data challenges, infrastructure challenges, and ethical quandaries that I faced along the way. What you're not going to see are any pre-trained proprietary models, you're not going to see any prompt engineering, you're not going to see any non-consensual data use, and you're not going to see any beautiful code. All of it's really ugly. Um, I made a lot of one-time use code that fulfilled its purpose for this piece, and uh, that's one of the advantages of being an individual artist making an individual piece, is not having to resolve your technical debt, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So this is sort of the structure of what I'll talk about. I'll talk about the background and goals for this specific piece, uh, the data collection process, the model selection process, just a little bit about the infrastructure I used, uh, and the development uh, process, and the hardest part of which is deciding when is it done. Um, and then a little bit about how I composed the piece and future directions. So back in 2020, when everything shut down, I had just started a data science boot camp. And as someone who had been working in music and experimental music since about 2011, I immediately saw applications of some of the techniques I was learning in this data science boot camp to creative work. And these are just some early little experiments I did. So the grid here is an abstract drawing that I had a random forest model try to complete for me. The photographs of airplanes in the lower right are not actually photographs. They were generated by a DCGAN, a type of uh, generative adversarial network. Um, I made a Twitter bot that uh, generates uh, angsty moth poetry. <laughs> but where I got really excited is when I learned that if you take a neural network, you can pretty easily change the dimensions of the input data and the output data that are desired and generate almost any form of data that you want. And so I said, okay, well, if I can generate images, I can generate audio. And I immediately saw applications to music. So these are going to be some really boring audio samples, but I was excited about them. No. 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 So those are my first little experiments generating audio with an adversarial network structure. And I used a data set that was like a crowdsourced uh, bunch of like single syllable words that Google put together and made public. Um, and I, I sketched out the idea for a piece where you could generate sound and have live performers interact with the generated sound. And so that uh, finally in 2022, uh, Tapir Lab at the University of Toronto commissioned me to write this piece, Approximations, a piece for accordion, percussion, and two neural networks. Each of the neural networks trained on one of those two performers. And um, it's a proof of concept. That's why I called it a proof of concept composition. It's a proof of concept as much as a musical composition. I wanted to kind of test out this idea, show that it was possible, and get through some of the early uh, challenges of working with neural networks just as an individual. So this piece premiered on Friday. I unfortunately don't have the official recording or video yet, but um, I'll play a little snippet from my phone just so you can get a vibe for what the final thing sounds like. idea of kind of the final result there. So the goal in creating the piece was not to create a composition that was generated by a neural network. There are a lot of examples of people, for example, training neural networks on like all of Bach's fugues or on a lot of Baroque music or on Mozart and having it generate like a score or generate um, sort of music, larger musical structures. That was not my goal. My goal was to actually have the networks generating snippets of audio that I as the composer would then combine into a piece of music so that the creation of the samples I was using was a stochastic process. That is a process involving chance, which all neural networks are uh, sort of statistics machines that's very much based on chance. 
but rather like this, the timbres themselves would be have an element of stochasticity to them, and then the actual composition would be my own decision making as a composer. And I wanted to generate snippets of sound that share the timbre of the two performers. So. T uh, show of hands, how many people are familiar with the word timbre from like music lessons or anything? Yeah, for those who are familiar, this will be old news, but timbre is basically the quality of a sound. So my voice sounds different from my friend's voice. Those are diff two different timbres, and that's how you can tell us apart. The timbre of a violin is different from the timbre of a flute. That's how you can tell them apart. I wanted to generate snippets of sound that share the timbre of the two individual performers I was working with. So in this case, accordion and percussion. And so when I presented this idea to a couple of friends, they each expressed confusion about this concept in ways that I think are really informative um, and reflect how uh, we collectively tend to think about the use of machine learning and neural networks, uh, especially creative, like generative AI. So I bought my friend Ethan coffee at a certain point in this process because I was having trouble figuring out which kind of uh, net neural network architecture to select. And I wanted to pick his brain. And so I mentioned to him, uh, my concept, and he just looked really confused. Now, Ethan is an engineer at Google Magenta. He's a person whose entire life's work is uh, generative audio applications. Um, and he and I happened to go to undergraduate together. Uh, it, we both have degrees in jazz studies from the same school of music. So he's both an artist and an engineer. But when I proposed the idea that I, as an artist, wanted to make a piece training networks, he just kind of shook his head. Because to him, the idea of an artist knowing enough about neural networks to actually use them was kind of inconceivable. And I think that's a misconception that a lot of us have, and I sometimes share, the idea that an artist is a different, qualitatively, a different uh, person than an engineer. Um, and for anyone who has a creative practice, which I'm sure some of you do, artists master all kinds of crazy, technical, intricate processes in order to generate their work. If anyone's ever tried to set up a loom, which I just learned how to do, like people who weave fabric are mechanical engineers. They just are. Um, and so I think it's a misperception that uh, machine learning can't be one of the tools that artists spend some time and learn how to use uh, as part of their toolbox. The other friend of mine, I, I also bought coffee to help me with the training process when I wasn't sure my models were converging. Alice is a data scientist working on GitHub Copilot, and she's also an accomplished video artist. She does generative video. And um, I was having trouble figuring out whether my models were converging. And I, I was training these models from scratch. They, had, they were not pre-trained. And she was just like, well, why don't you just, why don't you just use Amazon's pre-trained percussion model? And she seemed confused that, first of all, that absolutely does not exist. Uh, and second of all, the, uh, the idea of uh, using a model that didn't have any, a massive amount of pre-training was confusing. And I think that's another thing I hear a lot is like, oh, like, how, how are you going to leverage existing tools? Why don't you just leverage existing tools for your creative work? Because there's already a lot of people who've done a lot of work to make these models. And the answer is like, there are applications that artists have thought of that, engineering teams at Amazon or wherever haven't necessarily thought of. There's ways I want to use this that haven't already been supported. And you can do it yourself. So that's kind of a, one of my messages in, in making this piece. So that's a little background about the piece. Um, I'm going to talk about data collection. And there's an ethical quandary that I wanted to address in the data collection uh, for this piece. Because uh, one of the questions that the proof of concept piece uh, attempts to kind of answer is, how can an individual artist generate material and source the data only from consenting, limited consenting sources or specific individuals who have a style that you might want to emulate? So for example, like if I as a visual artist want to generate more visual work in my own style, how can I create a network that is only trained on my own work that's not going to plagiarize somebody else's visual style. And also, who's going to own the model and the outputs of that model in the future? In this case, I've actually signed the rights to the model and all future generative output to the two performers whose data trained it. So I think that that's one of the things I wanted to address with the sort of data collection process is how can you just take data from people who want you to take their data and in a limited number of people in a limited way and still make something convincing? So uh, when uh, Tape Your Lab commissioned me, they assigned me these two data sources. These were my data sources, collaborators, and now friends. Uh, Louis Pino, who's a percussionist. Uh, I don't really know what that thing is, some kind of percussion-y horn thing. Um, and Mati Polki, who is an amazing virtuosic accordion player. And um, 
they each provided me between 35 and 50 minutes of solo improvisations, and that was all the that was all the training data I was provided by these artists. I was working with them. They were volunteering their time. I didn't want to ask them for massive time a massive amount of work, and um, so I had to figure out how to augment this data because. 35 to 50 minutes of data is not enough to train a neural network. So I used a Python Librosa library, for those familiar with it, and I augmented that audio data to between eight and a quarter and nine hours of data per performer, using slight time shifts, slight pitch shifts, cutting out pieces here and there, rearranging them. And um, it was pointed out to me during this process that whatever tool you use to augment your data is going to introduce artifacts into that data. So, um, and like, I used Librosa's, like, kind of pitch shift and time shift tools that they already had built. That's going to introduce things like uh, undesirable frequencies or rhythmic patterns into the data. To be honest, for this project, I didn't worry about that too much. I just went with it. But for future projects, as an area I want to dig into is, like, data augmentation in a way that minimizes the artifacts introduced into the data. This brings me to my first big challenge as like an individual trying to work with a neural network from scratch is data volume. So the model I wound up selecting to train, which is WaveNet, um, the original WaveNet paper was used, it was used for speech generation, and they used between 44 and 48 hours of input data per voice they wanted to train it on. So that's a massive amount of data. It's really hard to achieve that as an individual. And that's something that any individual artist is going to um, struggle with when they first start with this. Um, just to give you an example, uh, I'm going to play little, these are just like little one second chunks that I've cut out of the training data. It's not, the training data wasn't cut into one second chunks. But just to give you an idea of the breadth of the sounds that were coming in from these two performers. So in both of these cases, there wasn't just one kind of sound in the, in the training data. There's multiple kinds of sounds, especially with the percussionist. The percussionist was playing a bass drum. He was playing a snare drum. He was playing cymbals. He was playing bells. He was playing a lot of different things. What that means is that my training data was multimodal. There wasn't just one way to sound like that instrument. There was a bunch of ways to potentially sound like that instrument. And um, so uh, a future step for me is, uh, going through the data and labeling second by second what's going on. I did not use labels in this process, and that might have been a mistake. I think that would allow the models to converge much more quickly. Um, but yeah, instead of, it's not, it's basically the network is trying to sound like 20 things at once instead of one thing. Um, and then, fun little side story, uh, I learned quickly that I was going to have to trim silence out of the training data and set a threshold for the quietest sound I wanted to include because, uh, the way these networks tend to work, like big picture for a lot of generative networks, they start by generating noise, just totally random noise. And over the training iterations, they, they check that noise against the training data. They're like, do these sound the same? No, OK. And they try again. And they're like, do these sound the same? No, OK. And they try again, do these sound the same? And what it quickly learned is that it generated, if it generated absolute silence, that's a valid audio signal. So it just started generating like seconds and minutes of silence. So I had to actually go back and be really deliberate about cutting out silence because it just this was what it was generating, just like nothing. <laughs> okay, so now I have training data, I've augmented it, and uh, I have to select a model. I kept a narrative journal of this whole process, and I'm going to quote from it now. I started with literature search. I pulled papers on adversarial audio synthesis and a variety of techniques for generation, including some published since January 2021 when I first started playing around with these networks. I did a deep read of the WaveNet paper, and then I realized I may as well start with the structures I already know, since I'm unlikely to have time to do a review of the entire field. This is a list of the structures I kind of skimmed and explored. Some of these are fundamentally uh, CNN-based, so convolutional neural network. Uh, some are RNN and LSTM-based. And by the way, I'm using a lot of jargon. Uh, these slides are going to be made available after the conference, and I've included a bunch of like an appendix of vocabulary slides if anyone is interested. There's also links to stuff if you have any curiosity about these uh, technologies. Um, basically, it's a whole variety of types of architectures. 
Some of them take raw audio data as input. Some of them take extracted features of audio as input. Some are geared specifically producing speech, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I skimmed all of these, and I basically boiled it down to just two models, WaveNet, which came out in 2016, and Dance Diffusion, which came out last year. I had played around with a variety of them. I did sort of tests on a variety of them. And in the end, WaveNet is not the newest, shiniest, or greatest thing, but it worked, and I was confident I was going to be able to do what I wanted with it. And so um, that's why I settled on WaveNet. And then late in the composition process, when I realized I wasn't getting the kind of timbral variety I wanted out of WaveNet alone, I went ahead and also used a little bit of Dance Diffusion, which is by Zach Evans at Harmon AI, um, to add a little timbral variety. So I'll talk about both of those models. Second challenge of being an individual artist trying to do this is lack of time. Like most of us in this room, I have a full-time engineering job. I then practice my instrument after that. And um, for anyone who has a creative practice outside of work, you know it's very hard to find time to make this happen. And so uh, I could have d d really dug in and tried to use the latest and greatest models and try to code everything up and like test every single possibility. In the end, I went with something that I knew that worked, and I'm sure many of you uh, who are on engineering teams have had to do that from time to time as well. In the end, have it, like ignoring uh, sort of the current demands, uh, what am I trying to say? Ignoring the latest and greatest and most maintainable things can turn into technical debt because I'm an individual artist. Uh, that isn't necessarily the case for me. Uh, however, I'm going to be starting a PhD in the fall in this area, and so basically I just generated a PhD's worth of technical debt for myself, unfortunately. Uh, it'll probably take me five years to fix. Um, so quick overview of the network wave net that I focused on. So a neural network, very roughly, some of you are no way more than I do about this, but a neural network, very roughly, um, is a series of nodes that are arranged into layers. And by nodes, I mean like little statistics machines. And um, there's typically an input layer and then a series of hidden layers and then an output layer and the data is passed in various ways between these layers. And there's all different kinds of ways to structure a neural network and um, the WaveNet architecture is based very much on CNNs, convolutional neural networks. And uh, I'll talk briefly about what that means. So this is the best visual I've managed to find for what a convolutional layer in a neural network does. So. The blue square here is your input data. In this case, it's two-dimensional. It's like an image, for example. The green square up top that's three by three is a filter. It's a filter that checks for a specific feature. And then what it does is it convolves across all of the input data. And for each of those little blocks of input data, it says, is the feature present here? Yes or no? Is the feature present here? Yes or no? And that's a, that's a pretty extreme simplification, but that's basically what it does. It moves across the entire input data, and it creates a reduced feature map. So in this visual, this uh, big square on the left is the input data. The 3 by 3 blue square is the filter. And then on the right-hand side, the sort of medium-sized square is a feature map that's been generated by convolving that blue filter across the input data. So this is a really great structure for computer vis like. Visual processing, computer vision, also audio, because it basically allows you to extract the, feature, the, the features of a massive amount of data into a much smaller space. And what's particularly interesting about the WaveNet architecture is that it combines this kind of convolutional layer with dilation, which means that for every layer of the network, you're doing a convolution across all the input data, but the size of your filter is changing with each layer. So in this case, we see it's a three by three filter. It might be a two by two filter. It might be a 32 by 32 filter. And in each case, you're picking up on features and patterns and structures at different scales of the input data, which is super important for something like audio because like if you think about the sound of a flute, there's structure in terms of um, the pitch, like the sine waves that make up the sound of the flute. There's structure in terms of the shape of a note and the shape of a measure, the shape of a phrase, the shape of a piece of music. Sound displays structure at a lot of different sort of magnitudes, and um, convolutional neural networks are fantastic for uh, picking that up. Briefly on dance diffusion, um, 
It's a different kind of model. Dolly 2 is probably the most well-known example of a diffusion model that's like super popular right now. But um, dance diffusion is basically a, a noiser, denoiser process where if you start with your input data as this picture of a very cute cat, you just add tons and tons of noise to it. And then you actually get the computer to guess what the original image was from the noise data. So it like noises the data and then it denoises it into something new. Um, and uh, so the dance diffusion model I use late in the process is a, is a diffusion type model. Uh, I won't dwell long on infrastructure. Um, I ran my models on some Google VMs. Um, I struggled, I won't lie. I am not an ML ops engineer which is the big takeaway for me from this section. I'm sure I selected VMs that had maybe not the right uh, capacity, maybe were not optimized for my task, and this is another thing that I want to dig into in the future, um, and just kind of forgive myself for selecting some, some VMs that may not have been the best choice. Um, and this is gonna be another challenge for any individual artist who wants to work with uh, neural networks, is how are you gonna do your infrastructure? Are you gonna use cloud infrastructure? Are you gonna buy a GPU? What are you gonna do? Um, so at this point, okay, I have, I have a model selected, I have input data, it's been augmented, I have checkpointing set up for my model, I have snapshots set up for my virtual machine volumes, I have everything ready to go, and so now it's time to iterate and iterate and iterate and I optimize the hyperparameters of the model. So you don't have to read this. This is just me doing the stereotypical data scientist thing where I made a spreadsheet of every time I ran the model and what I changed. Um, I've been told this is an undesirable practice, but it works for me, so I do it. Um, <laughs> Uh, I tuned, this is a list of some of the hyperparameters I was tuning. So when we talk about neural networks, there's parameters and then there's hyperparameters. And parameters are sort of internal to the model. They're the statistical weights in each of these nodes that the model is adjusting itself over the course of the training. Hyperparameters are sort of human tunable uh, parameters that change the structure or behavior of the training process. So they're the things the humans can touch to make the training process different. These are sort of the final values I landed on. The most important one is this sample size or analysis window size, which is the size of block of input data I could take into memory at each training step and work on each training step, and that was limited essentially by um, the memory of the infrastructure I was using. Uh, you want as large a training window as possible for this kind of task. Uh, this is a snippet from a config file I was using for the model. Um, this is the part I want to point out is this dilations block right here. That is a list of 80 integers, and what that means is that there were 80 convolutional layers in this model. That is like a very deep network, um, and that made training very slow. <laughs> um, Iteration speed was a serious challenge in this project. It would take multiple days of training and tens of thousands of training steps before I'd feel confident even looking at the loss function to see if the model was starting to converge. And even if it looked like it was, I wasn't confident whether it was actually converging or it was landing on a local minimum. For those who attended the um, earlier talk about, uh, uh, about uh, oh gosh, uh, the one right before lunch about uh, machine learning, and he was talking about um, local minima and, and global minima. I was never sure if it was hitting the right minimum or if it was hitting like a local minimum. Anyway, it took a long time to do each training run and figure out if the model was even coming close to working. I calculated that the very first training run I did cost about $152. And then each subsequent training run cost about $125 just to get to the point where I had figured out whether the model was gonna converge or not. And so when I began this project, uh, my total budget for infra was $635. And uh, blew through that, this is what I actually spent, plus $22 for coffee, uh, including an $11 adaptogenic fungus latte that I would not have bought if I had known it was $11. Uh, I tried estimating the time commitment this project took, and I just didn't even know where to begin. Um, between the playing around I've done at like some artist residencies over the years, the boot camp that I did, this has like been a long time in the works, and one of my goals eventually with mapping out all these challenges is to figure out a way to get artists um, more knowledgeable about, like knowledgeable enough about this in a shorter time to really begin to work with it. Okay, so finally the model is training, all the hyperparameters are in their final sort of state. Uh, okay, when's it done? 
Uh, well, I'm sure you all have faced the situation where it's like, uh, do we ship it now or do we ship it when it's perfect? Um, and uh, in my case, I got, because I, I was lucky because it was just me working on this and I was doing a creative project, I as the composer got to decide, when does this sound the way I want it to sound? And uh, one of the big challenges with audio generation that I hit very, very early on is just, um, it's fairly easy to get a generative network to reproduce your input audio exactly. It just sounds, to create something that sounds exactly like the input audio, but that is not interesting. And that is not what I wanted to make. I wanted to make something that was original and that was a little bit like the input data, but enough different to make a creative project out of it. Um, and the loss function, by the way, doesn't tell you how good something sounds. <laughs> so <laughs> you have to do a lot of like pull the model, generate some audio, and see what you see what you're hearing. I'm just gonna. This is a quick demo of this kind of diagram because I'm gonna pop a few of these up on the screen over the next couple slides. This is a short time Fourier transform. It's basically a way of looking at an audio signal, uh, sound power spectrum. So if you the x-axis on each of these is time. The y-axis is frequency, and then the brightness of each pixel is the strength of the sound at that frequency in time. So this is just another way to represent uh, audio, and I'll be using these over the next couple of slides. So the accordion sounds uh, converge much more quickly than the percussion sounds, probably because the accordion sounds were less multimodal than the percussion sounds. So I'll give some examples here. So at only 7,450 7, training steps, which is like very, very early in the training process, that's what it sounded like. It sounded like noise. Okay, so now we get to uh, 54,850. Okay, maybe it's like starting to sound a little bit like an accordion. And uh, it becomes a lot more delicate by 92,000. So if you, so this is the no, this is 7,000 some, like super noisy spectrum there. And then this is the spectrum at 149,000. You can see clear overtones uh, popping out in the spectrum, and this is what it sounded like. Which is actually very, very similar to some of the cluster chords he was playing in the input data. Uh, and then this is the spectrum at 345,000, and here's what it sounds like. So one of the cool things about this, it still isn't great at picking out like a single pitch. And it went through a phase where it was good at picking out a single pitch, but then it would just like play it so loud you couldn't stand it. Um, is that one of the cool things about this is you can see it actually changes timbre in the middle. It can tell, it's like trying to change notes because it can tell the input data is doing that. Um, to be fair, I did a lot of picking and choosing these examples uh, and that's how a lot of papers you see published about audio generation do it. They'll be like, wow, look at this cool thing it generated and they don't play like the 10 really horrible things it generated. To be fair, I'm doing that too. Um, so the percussion sounds, uh, Pretty immediately, the network figured out that percussion sounds have a sharp envelope. By that I mean it like it's a short sound. Then it went through a whistling phase for some reason. <laughs> it went through, it actually went through a phase where, so the percussionist recorded his audio in a room where there was a strong air conditioner rattle. For a while, all it did was produce air conditioner rattle. <laughs> um, Let's see, so that's, that's that visual there is the whistling phase. You can see it's a little uh, whistle, and let's see what it sounds like here. So that's a bass drum, it's trying to do a bass drum. Okay, that kind of sounds like a percussion instrument. And it was really at about 300,000 that it hit a stride making some interesting sounds. So, these sounds that you just heard, the sort of final state of them, are what resulted after over a full month of training time. And I'm sure I could cut that down with optimizing my choice of infrastructure and uh, all kinds of stuff, but it was quite a long process to achieve this. Um, the percussion network trained to over 400,000 steps, but it actually didn't, start, didn't sound any better after about 300,000, which is why I cut off using, using that model there. Um, 
Yeah, so at this point, I have generated sounds. I have a model that can continue to generate different sounds. And so now I need to stitch them together into composition. I'll just briefly mention this. Um, I wound up generating sounds that were between about one and four seconds long from the models. And then I wrote some extremely sloppy, you don't have to read this, but it's real ugly, some extremely sloppy Python functions that stitch together those sounds into larger blocks of sound. I, I created this thing called a uh, stereo salad that would like pick out sounds and generate them and then stitch them together and like some pulses and grains and um, different lengths of s sounds. Um, and one of the things that I think is fun about this is like, and about the whole piece really is that it challenges the traditional composer performer relationship you see with a lot of music. Like in the classical music world, there's this thing where like there's the composer and they write a piece of music and then they tell the performers what to do. And then the performers have to re faithfully recreate what the composer has told them. And I think the cool thing about this project is that like it's a very sort of uh, non-linear process where the network that's generating the electronic sounds is doing so based on the sounds of the performers themselves. And then I, as the composer, am taking the sounds generated by that network and trying to make something that fits with the performers and then they get to interpret that. So I think there's like a lot of layers to that um, sort of relationship in this, in this piece. Um, I'll play a couple of the larger generated sound blocks um, that I created with those functions after sort of the final generation step. So this is, uh, let's see, movement four. I wrote five short movements. <laughs> So that's sort of one sound world. Here's another sound world. Here's how I notated uh, the electronics for the performers. So the very bottom line of each staff, you can see I just kind of put the waveform of the electronics there so they would have a guide for um, when what was happening in the sound. And then yeah, this piece premiered on Friday. The performers sounded great. Um, I'll play a different little snippet of it here. briefly go over some future directions I want to take that <clears throat> excuse me take this work um, I definitely want to explore other network structures WaveNet is old I guess things from 2016 are like super old now um, <laughs> I definitely uh, want to become more versed in some more recent structures which is extremely hard because this field moves very fast but it's gonna be it's gonna be a job to do um, I want to maybe consider switching over from using TensorFlow to using PyTorch because, uh, as mentioned in a previous talk, for some reason it's like not as cool to learn TensorFlow anymore. I'm not entirely sure why. Um, I want to get better at audio data augmentation because I think that's going to be crucial for generating sound from such a limited, like, individual source. Oh, wrong button. I'm going to buy a GPU because spending $1,800 on uh, cloud infrastructure is not very practical. And I think that I uh, should have just bought a GPU in the first place, but now I know that. And then uh, another thing I want to do in terms of like beyond my own personal practice is uh, next winter uh, I'm going to be starting a lecture demo series called Chicago Creative Machines that features the work of artists who use machine learning and deep learning as sort of a lower level, like not proprietary models, but people who are developing their own models for their own work. So stay tuned for that. I haven't put up socials for it yet, but it will exist next winter. Um, and they'll be able to do like a performance along with a technical lecture about how they do their work. And then I want to kind of move forward into figuring out ways to encourage artists or come up with resources for artists to get into using machine learning and think about it as a creative tool in everybody's own tool belt. Um, 
this is a summary of the challenges I've talked about. So there's data volume, data quality. Um, there, your data will need to be augmented if you're an individual trying to train a neural network. Uh, you have to think about how it's going to be augmented. You can think about how it's going to be augmented in a way that doesn't compromise your own vision or your own ethics. Um, and uh, you need to be very clear with your data sources. Like, ask your percussion is not to record in a room full of HVAC rattle. Um, you need the time to develop some skill, and this is where I want to really do some thinking, is how to bring people into the machine learning world in a way that's comfortable and confident, and that allows them to think about where they could take it uh, in less time than it took me, frankly, uh, which was many years of experimenting and, and kind of playing around before I actually felt confident doing a full project. Um, and then, of course, cost is a big challenge. And uh, yeah, with the eventual goal in all this of making sure that artists are included ethically in the future of generative AI research and use. Right now it's often teams of engineers at large companies or small teams at universities who are developing these tools, and that's great. But I think artists can have a lot of really creative ideas of where this could go and how to make generative AI a tool that can be sort of symbiotic with artists' creative process instead of something that like replaces artists. And for what it's worth, um, I just got access yesterday to uh, Google's Music LM, that text to music generator, and I tried having it generate an accordion percussion piece, and it sucks. So, like, <laughs> it's also entirely possible that as an individual artist, you can make something that's like way better for what you want to do than like what the big models are doing. Um, with like. Just a minute here, I would love to do a brief creative exercise since I have a, cre a daily creative practice. Um, if y'all could grab like your phone or your whatever you feel comfortable taking notes on, if it's like a notebook. And um, I'm just gonna like have a timer set for like 40 seconds. And um, I just want you to think about the tools you use regularly in your engineering work and think of a way that either you or an artist could use those to make Art, just something that's from the heart, something that you can, th a way you can think of uh, making your tools into an art piece, whether it's like a beautiful data visualization or like a database as a piece of art, anything. So, yeah, get, go for it. Figure out something that you would like to do artistically with your tools. All right, just, just a few seconds to wrap that up. Cool. Uh, thank you all for, for being here. Quick thanks to Igor Babushkin and Zach Evans at Harmon AI, who uh, made a lot of the model magic happen between, behind the models. Thanks to my three friends, Ethan, Alice, and Monsi, for like, troubleshooting when I was pulling my hair out. Um, yeah, and I'm open for questions if anybody has them. Thank you.